As you heard John write in his epistle, Dear friends, let us love one another. You know, if it were just that simple, right? You know, if all we needed were just a few encouraging words kind of directing us back to our better selves, you know, then our, our friendships, our family life, our congregational life would finally be so much better and, and kinder and more wonderful. Ah, oh, let's just hold hands right now, right? I mean, you know, if that's all we really needed, you know, just... Yeah, except, well, of course, we kind of know that's just kind of dreaming, right? You know, it's, it needs a lot more than that. And, you know, but John, he doesn't give up on his theme. He actually believes that these are more than just pretty words, more than just something that you might write in a card to somebody wishing them well during the season. He actually believes and he doubles down in verse 11. He says it again. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Oh, yeah, he brings God into the equation now. It's like, okay, you, you didn't think you could do this. Well, well, God's loving you, so now you ought to. You know, he puts a big old finger in your face. He says, yeah, get on it, you know. And it's like, okay, yeah, we, we know. We know we should love other people. We want to. Ah, oh, but it's, it's not that our, our family lives are just so dysfunctional that we can't even get together. I mean, I mean some have gotten to that point, but, but most of the time we can gather for holidays like this one and birthdays, Sunday brunch. We get together as our con with our congregational members every week, and, and yeah, we, we can do this. But I have one diagnostic question for you to kind of think about. I mean, just, just think about the level of, of depth of the connections that you have in this congregation, if this is your regular place. And if not, then the congregation that you do go to. Think about how many people's names that you know that you see every week. And then, do you know their story of their life? Are, are, you, are you praying for them? Are they praying for you? Have you been to their house because they needed help? I mean, when you, when you really think about how deep the relationships are... They're kind of on the shallow end. Oh, we can be polite and, and talk to one another about, you know, sports and the Shockers and K-State football and, and how the kids are doing. But that's kind of up here, not down in the real deep part. In fact, the more you think about that diagnostic question, the more you realize that, well, even, even your friendships really don't go too deep, even... Even your relationship with your spouse could probably go much deeper, more compassionate, more tender for the real you that's, that's there. And, and maybe you've seen this has been published recently, uh, a big study in the United States that there is a huge epidemic in our country as connected as we are through the Internet and phones. The epidemic of loneliness is rampant. And that... Even with all of the people around us, we are becoming more and more isolated and the ache of our heart is growing, which is quite baffling when you think about all the people in this room and as many that gather on a Sunday morning and as many people in your house all the time. How could we be such a lonely people? Well, and the question is kind of focused on, well, why then are some people just so hard to love? Because, you know, really, that's the problem, right? <laughs> you know, well, why do they got to be that way? And then why, why are we that way sometimes? It's like, oh, yeah. Well, the answer to the question why some people are so hard and why you are is that love is really hard. Deep, intimate love is hard. And we have so many things against us, just even in our culture. We live in a culture that is dead set against relationships because it's a competitive culture. It's you have to step on somebody else to get a little bit higher where you are. You have to make sure that you're getting ahead by pushing down on others. And, and we live in a culture where years ago, if you said something about someone else, it just kind of died there. But now you can post it forever on the internet and it's there with all of its cruelty and harshness. 
But you'd think, you know, no, in, in the safety of our family relationships, though, there, there we could really go deep. But it's, there is an undertow, even in our families, of judgment. You know what I'm talking about. It's like you show up, it's like, oh, wow. That's how you're going to parent your kids? Okay, fine, uh-huh. And, and then, oh, 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 so you're going to get a job yet? You're going to get married yet? You know, you're going to have kids yet? All that stuff just kind of floating out there. And, and, and it'd be nice to be able just to blame other people. You know, it's our culture, it's our family, but it's, it's inside of us. We, we are constantly sizing each other up with envy and jealousies. Like, well, she has a better job. You know, oh, they take better vacations. Well, their kids seem to like each other, you know, and it's just this constant, ah, oh, and, and, and there, there we are, kind of on the top, just bouncing along in the shallow end and never really able to plunge into the depths. And you probably could live the rest of your life that way, except there's one problem, is that you and I were created to have deep, meaningful relationships with God and one another. It's just nobody gets a pass. Nobody gets exempted from this need to be truly known to our depths and to know other people, to be vulnerable and to show up and be compassionate, even with people's crazy ideas and their dreams and their failures that didn't make it. To be able to give to one another no matter who they are or what they've done, a certain amount of dignity and respect simply because they are someone whom God has made in his own image. This is where we are. And because our hearts are so tender and everybody needs this kind of being known and knowing, and the world is so harsh with its barbs and attacks, with its long stretches of rejection and indifference to us, that you just have to kind of put on some protection for your heart, you know, just to make sure you don't get crushed by it all. And, and you put on, there's lots of ways you could do this, but two of the, the normal ways are that you just kind of put up this big hard shell, you know, nothing gets in, nothing gets out. You know, that, like, never let them see you cry. You know, if I were hurting, I'd never tell you. You just keep your head down, you keep going. Or you take the flip side, and you just stay happy. You know, make sure everybody's happy. Try and please everybody, you know, or, or just happy all the time. And, well, you can keep yourself relatively safe under this armor and protection, but it is increasingly lonely there. And lonely is painful. It's the pits. But no problem. In our culture, we have lots of ways to numb up. Lots of chemicals, either prescribed or uh, otherwise. And, and then, you know, you can kind of get through life a little easier. You know, maybe it's just working real hard and just never doing anything but working. Or it's just withdrawing from everything. You just, I can't do anything, just procrastinate. You know, well, the nice thing about numbing is that you don't have to feel it. But the problem is not, it's not very precise. That you numb one area, then everything goes numb. If you're trying to protect yourself, then you can't really give yourself either. That's the reason it's so hard to be married to somebody who's addicted to something, a substance or pornography or, or just their work or whatever it is. They're just not available emotionally. I mean, think about the last time you went to the dentist and you got your tooth fixed, right? And then they went in and they deadened that tooth, right? But it wasn't just the tooth. Your whole mouth, <laughs> your lips, your cheek, your tongue, you know, you're drooling. Because that's how numbing works. Everything goes out. So between uh, armoring up because of protection and, and numbing up because of pain, we really never show up for one another. Not the real us. Not the vulnerable, compassionate, available us that truly can care about the needs of the other person. So as we hear these words of John, who wrote them so sincerely and actually meant that these words actually be done, we agree that it's true. We, we should. We ought to love one another, but there's no power in us to truly do it from our depths. And that's what Christmas is all about. Charlie Brown, you know, that God came to us in a particular way 
on purpose. Think about it. He came to us as a baby. There's nothing more vulnerable. There's no armor there. There's nothing to protect him. He came as a baby. And then he would face all of the barbs and the attacks of humanity. We would spit on him, punch him, crown him with thorns, abuse him, neglect him, dismiss him as a fraud, call him a liar, call him the Satan himself. We, we would run him through with nails and spear, forsaken of God. More than just being posted on Facebook as a jerk, he's posted on a cross, publicly humiliated. Why would Jesus be born this way? Why would he die this way? Because that's what love is. You know, in those darker moments and you're kind of crying like, I don't even know what love is. Well, here it is. Listen up. Love is showing up, being available completely, utterly to your depths, and then sacrificing your own self for the needs of the other. That's what love is. God has given first of himself completely, utterly, into death for us. I mean, how else could we really know him unless he gave all of himself? How could we live in his love if it was just a power, if he came in power and he just forced his good ideas on us? Or, or <clears throat> he, he guilted us and bullied us into, well, you better, you ought to. He didn't do it that way. Although we do it that way all the time. Not Jesus. He came completely vulnerable to your rejection of him. To your dismissal of him. I don't believe it. To your, to your misuse of his love as just another numbing agent in your life. In spite of all of this, he showed up to you and to me. And there... In Jesus, we finally find the power to do what John was writing about. The power to actually do it right here and right now in your own family gatherings, in our own congregational gathering. But to put this into practice, you need the three things. You need to receive it, you need to live in it, and you need to give it. To receive it, is the realization that it is a gift. And the it is Jesus, his love, him, all of him. He came as a gift. And that's the reason all those beautiful presents are under your tree. It's an echo of God's gift to us at Christmas. To receive it means you have to let go of what you're already holding on to to take care of yourself. See, so your hands are already grasping something so that you're protected, so that you're okay. To receive Jesus as the gift is he will be the one who declares I'm okay. I'm lovable. I'm worth something. And so then to rely on Jesus, to live in Jesus, then <clears throat> that's what he talks about. We know we rely on the love God has for us. See, so you rely on him in what he says about you, rather than the attacks and the barbs of others, rather than the betrayals of others and just trying to please them and fit in, here you rely that God makes you his own. And then finally, it has to be given. That's what love is. It gives for the sake and the good of the other. It is often a sacrifice. Isn't it, isn't it work? to actually show up. You know, it's just easier to not, you know, just, I'll be with you in a moment. You know, it's just easier not to show up. It's just easier to spend hours on Facebook rather than show up to your family. It's just easier to numb up. But here is your strength and your power and the love to protect you, and be able to give you what you do not have, the ability to give all of yourself for the sake of of the other. Imagine your family gathering if you're there and you're available and you're concerned about the good of the others. Imagine our congregational life. Imagine our community if all of us were out there. It's not a dream. It's not just a wishful thinking. 
it's the actual reality of living with and in God because God is love. And whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. We are those God-indwelt people in the community. Receive it. It's yours. Rely on it. You have the strength now to give it. Amen. I invite you to stand as we make confession of our faith that we have.